introduce you to Abby. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Abby. So she's going to be managing our chat function today. She works within the producer certification team and she's the dedicated point of contact for all of our Scottish licensees and a lot of our Northern based licensees as well. Um, so please say hello to her. And um, just a note on any questions that you might have, ideas or thoughts, please pop them into the chat um, and then we can discuss those at the end. And Abby will be posting a few sort of relevant links as we go through. Um, just an introduction to myself, I'm Beth, Farming Business Development Manager, Soil Association Certification, um, so supporting the growth of the um, organic sector for farming. And I've been at the Soil Association for five years now. Um, I was previously in the producer team with Abby and looking after lots of our organic dairy farmers across the UK. Um, and I'm, like, farming is really in my roots. Um, I, I'm from a farming family. Um, my parents farm in Devon and they run their own um, meat and veg business. And I've been fully immersed in that since a really young age and still kind of get roped into doing the odd bit of holiday cover. Um, right, so to talk about what we're going to speak about today. Um, so we're in a period of great change, um, transitioning agricultural policy, landscape and trade, a changing climate and growing and emerging sustainable food and drink markets. And that's presenting um, opportunities and challenges for organic farmers. So we hope to sort of explore how organic farmers are building resilience into their farm business models going forward. In terms of an agenda, <clears throat> I'm first going to pass you over to Sophie, who works in the business development team with me. Um, and she's going to take you through an organic market overview and touch on some of the findings um, of sort of changing sustainable con consumer behavior. And then she'll pass you on to Adrian Steele, who works within the Soil Association charity. He's an organic arable farmer and organic sector development advisor. And he's going to talk you through the changes in agricultural policy and transitioning governmental support. And we hope this pro will provide a sort of context to then lead us on to what we hope to be a really interesting panel discussion with two of our organically certified farmers in the north of England. Bob Patton from Hexhamshire Organic runs an, runs an organic market garden and James Robinson, Strictly, the Strictly Farm, which is an organic dairy farm. And it'll be really useful to hear their sort of practical insights on how they found being organic and how they're building resilience into their future farming models. And then we'll have some time at the end to do um, a question and answer session. So like I said, please feel free to put, you know, as, as many questions as you like within the chat and then we'll um, address those at the end. Um, so by way of introduction, Soil Association Certification is one of the UK's leading organic certification bodies, certifying and inspecting <coughs> thousands of organic farms and food and drink businesses across the UK. We work in partnership with industry to support the development and growth of this sustainable sector, including growth of the organic market. Our standards are underpinned by law based on IFAME's four principles of organic agriculture, health, ecology, fairness and care. And we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the Soil Association charity and any sur surplus profit that we make um, is gift aided to the charity to continue their wider work for sustainable food and farming. So this uh, image just shows you the sort of far, far reaching nature of what the Soil Association charity do um, with a vision aims to support broad spectrum of farmers transitioning to agroecological and organic practices and um, involved in lots of different projects, um, just namely a couple um, innovative farmers, which acts as a vehicle for change, bringing together researchers and farmers to um, trial new approaches to farming, basically and continued focus upon healthy and sustainable diets, for instance, through the Food for Life School Dinners Programme, which started over 20 years ago now. Um, so that's me for introductions, and I'm just now going to pass you on to Sophie, who, as I said, is going to talk you through um, the organic market update. Thanks, Sophie. Hi, everyone. So my name's Sophie Kirk, and I work with Beth in our business development team within Soil Association Certification. I've worked for Soil Association Certification for just over three years now. And prior to that, I worked within um, local government supporting the development of short um, and local supply chains. Um, so 
obviously the whole session today is about resilience so and having a resilient um, marketplace for organic is obviously key so what I want to do today is just provide you with a brief overview of some of the information that we have on the organic market share that with you today and some some of the insights so soil association certification we do produce an annual organic market report which provides an overview of all of the trends and kind of consumer insights that's happening in the organic market we're currently collating lots of information for that and that's going to be published in february next year but we do have a bit of a sneak preview in, in some areas which we can share today um so that next slide please beth Oops, that going forwards. There we go. So this slide just basically just show some of the very positive press that the organic sector has received over the last few years. I'm sure some of you have seen it, um, but basically it's just reporting on some of the um, increases that we've seen in organic sales um, across the UK and some of the growth in the organic market. So good cover coverage across both national and trade press, um, which is linked to the uplift that we've seen in the organic market, which is partly linked to, uh, to the pandemic. Next slide, please, Beth. So what's happening in the organic market? This slide here shows the UK organic market trend from 2006 right the way through to what we predict to happen to the end of this year. Now, very positively, the organic market has entered its ninth consecutive year of growth. So it has been growing for a long time since the uh, recession back at the end of uh, 2010. Um, and 2020 was a really exceptional year for organic sales in the UK. Um, we saw 12.6% growth in the organic market, which is the highest growth seen in over 15 years. And this was partly due to the pandemic creating changes in shopping habits for both organic and non-organic food and drink sales. But it was above, the organic sales growth is significantly above non-organic and definitely changing consumer habits in terms of people looking for more sustainable British food and drink that they can trust um, certainly played into the, the growth that we've seen. Now, looking to this year, we expect to see um, sales of organic reaching around the three billion mark. Um, we'll know that for certain, as I say, once we've collated all the information for our organic market report. And sales through supermarkets, which we do have, have grown at 6% from the end of September last year to the end of September this year. So we're continuing to see strong growth. It has dropped back from that 12.6% growth we saw last year as kind of the shopping habits have returned to normal. But what we do know is that growth is significantly above the growth in non-organic, which is at around 2.4%. Next slide, please, Beth. So this slide here just shows um, what's happening um, in terms of uh, the organic growth for particular categories. And just a note of uh, caution, these uh, trends here only relate to sales made through supermarkets. It doesn't relate to sales made through other channels yet, such as home delivery and box schemes, but we'll come to that in a moment. So you can see that for all of the key categories, um, organic sales have outperformed the growth in non-organic. This is again from that year, from the end of September last year to the end of September this year. Uh, looking at dairy and produce, these are the engine rooms for organic sales in the UK. 50% of all organic food and drink sales made through supermarkets is a dairy or a produce sale. So these really are the key categories, really. Um, dairy seen relatively moderate growth at 2.5%. It is above the growth in non-organic, which is at 2.1%. Produce is, is a really positive story. We've seen 6.8% growth in this category to the end of September, which is significantly above the growth seen in non-organic produce, which is at 0.7%. And produce is becoming a kind of increasingly important area. We know that it's the entry point for new customers coming into organic. If they're going to try any organic product, it's likely to be an organic fruit, veg or salad product because of that kind of clear link to kind of health and sustainability. Um, and because partly it's, it's often the most kind of widely available um, organic product as well. A lot of even small stores will might have organic carrots or, or onions available, for example. Organic can and package has seen again moderate growth at 1.7%, but again, it's just slightly above the non-organic growth. And meat, fish and poultry has been a really interesting area. 
this um, category has seen 12.1% growth in three supermarkets this year, significantly above the growth of non-organic. And this is partly due to retailer range edits, is also partly due to changing consumer preferences and what we believe more people buying into the less but better meat trend. Next slide, please, Beth. And here we just pulled out some of the categories in a bit more detail here, um, which again sees the, the kind of growth, um, uh, you know, to, to the end of September. So we've got beef and lamb again, good growth there. Poultry, um, seeing growth at 9%. Organic yogurts has been the key um, kind of uh, product driving growth within the dairy, organic dairy category, that's seen growth at 4.2%. And again, a positive picture for veg, fruit and salad there. Next slide, please, Beth. So um, in terms of changes in consumer behaviour, we know there's been lots of changes as a result of the pandemic. We know that COVID-19 really acted as a trigger event, which made more people concerned about food and where it comes from and the environmental and health impact of their purchases. And despite things, um, you know, food service and, and you know, kind of changing hab um, shopping habits changing, back to some degree of normal. We know that some of the preferences and habits have stuck. We recently undertook some new um, shopper research to get a better understanding of where organic fits into kind of consumer preferences, particularly in relation to sustainability. And what we found is that 71% of consumers have become more concerned about the environment than ever before, and more concerned about the impact that their purchases have on the environment. And we've got some attitudes here, um, which go into a bit more depth. And if you just look at the two middle ones with 86 and 84 above, you can see that um, for one, people are looking, uh, they want to be able to trust food manufacturers and retailers. That's becoming increasingly important. And people wish food that was produced in a more natural way without excess processing and chemicals. So these are becoming some of the most important factors really uh, kind of in the sustainability mix, which of course plays into um, the strengths of organic, A, in terms of production, and secondly, in terms of um, providing that additional reassurance of trust and the fact that organic has that additional inspections across its supply chains. Uh, next slide, please, Beth. Following on from kind of consumer attitudes, this um, graph here shows some of the top reasons why people buy organic. And this is a graph done by Nielsen Homescan. So it's um, surveying supermarket shoppers specifically. And you can see here that the, the key reasons why people buy organic broadly fall into the category of buying it for health, buying it for the environment and buying it for animal welfare. Interestingly, buying organic because it has significantly fewer pesticides comes top of the list. We know that people uh, buy organic because they see it as a shortcut to health and having fewer pesticides is key to that as well as being key to um, sustainability benefits. Um, we can also see, as, as I said, uh, reasons better for the environment is a key reason why people buy organic. Quality and taste is in there and better for animal welfare is also increasingly important. Um, another piece of research just came out from our, our research that we've conducted really recently is that the term organic on pack has seen the highest increase in terms of persuasiveness. So that's looking at how persuasive a sustainability term is compared to other sustainability terms. So it was compared to other terms such as fair trade, British, vegan, um, and so on. And actually organic had seen the greatest increase in terms of people being persuaded to buy that. So um, I think people increasingly making that link between organic, sustainability, and health. Next slide, please, Beth. And um, coming to the end of my little bit, but I just wanted to flag some of the key opportunities that we see in the organic market and organic sales. And some of these opportunities really exist in terms of home delivery and online. So our last, well, this year's organic market report reported a 36% growth in home delivery, sorry, in sales made, organic sales made through home delivery and box schemes. That's excluding any online sales made through supermarkets. This is solely kind of through the, the independent box scheme and home delivery market. Um, so really kind of strong phenomenal sales there. And that was during 2020, the year of the pandemic. We know that more people than ever suddenly signed up to their local box schemes and people looking for kind of provenance, sustainability, British food, food that they can trust. Um, we know that anecdotally, um, that these box schemes are completely oversubscribed. We know that probably some of those customers have fallen away, but we do know that 
that the majority of the businesses that we speak to have seen an uplift in their customer base compared to pre-pandemic levels. And I think this is partly due to people wanting kind of sustainable food that they trust, but also wanting the convenience factor. So if they tried home delivery for the first time during the pandemic and they received a good service, many of them have continued um, to, use, to use that channel. We predict 25% or a quarter of all organic products to be purchased online by the close of this year. So it really is this kind of growing channel. That's partly because there's the broadest choice uh, for organic online. People can get all sorts of organic products which they might not have available in store. And looking at the supermarket trend as well, there's been a 33% growth in organic supermarket online sales as well. Um, that's from September last year to September this year. And really interestingly, bringing it back to producers, um, we have seen many farmers kind of innovating to be able to add value to their products and to be able to sell via more direct and short supply chains, collaborating with others in their local areas, other wholesalers, other packers, to be able to kind of access and make the most of this kind of burgeoning um, supply chains in home delivery and online. Um, and we've seen everything from people kind of bringing in milk vending machines to um, expanding their existing box schemes and as I say collaborating with others in their local area and trying to strengthen those local supply chains. So um, just to finish off, just final slide, please, Beth. Um, so in terms of the key opportunities for organic, um, we've seen this kind of increased interest in personal health and sustainability, which is really kind of linking into people choosing organic for those key reasons. We know that the pandemic has meant that people are you know, food assurance has become more important than ever. People are wanting that additional layer of trust and looking to purchase food from well-inspected supply chains. We know that high standards of animal welfare and production is becoming more important, particularly with all the kind of noise and press out there around kind of plant-based and so on. Um, people are kind of looking for less but better meat where organic can really kind of um, come in and kind of play to its strengths there. And we know that there is this growing kind of opportunity for quality food delivered direct to the door, which we feel is a, a great opportunity for the organic sector. Um, so hopefully that provides a quick whistle stop tour and I'm really happy to take any questions on the organic market at the end. Thank you. So uh, yeah, good, good evening everyone. Uh, do, do you want to take questions? No, so if you're, or, or, or are you happy to take them later? What, what do you think? Um, I'll just have a quick, shall, shall we, is it best to take them at the end, Beth, would you I say? Think, yeah, I think we'll take all the questions at the end, if that's okay. all right. Fine. Yeah. Brilliant. Fine. And uh, I completely forgot to hand over to you, Adrian. So, um, okay. yeah, <laughs> I'd like to ha yeah, introduce Adrian still, he works um, in the charity, but Adrian, let you introduce yourself. <laughs> Fine, yes, so, so, so I'm Adrian Steele. I'm an organic farmer uh, in Worcestershire. I've got a mixed uh, mixed farming business uh, with arable and uh, now a rear dairy heifers um, in, in place of, of a sheep flock. Um, I'm working as organic sector development advisor with the Soil Association and uh, with a specific sort of brief working with uh, DEFRA or in, in sort of embedded within DEFRA's various consultation bodies uh, around the agricultural transition plan. Uh, which is the, the framework uh, around which uh, we're going to be uh, developing a, an independent agricultural policy for, uh, I was going to say the UK, but it looks increasingly like GB, because uh, Northern Ireland is still basically in, in the single market, um, uh, as, as a result of, of, the, uh, of the Brexit uh, rift with, with continental Europe. So the, um, the, the general framing of this uh, is, is, is effectively a period of great stability um, is coming to an end uh, with, with UK agriculture. Um, and within that general environment that we're now finding ourselves, um, there are two, two distinct trends which are going to dictate profitability. Uh, one is just fundamental global commodity prices, um, and those can be impacted by sort of climate change, um, and things like swine flu in, in China, which have had the biggest impact on red meat prices uh, in, in England, certainly that, that I've, I've been uh, farming with uh, over a period of time. Um, and then also a, a public policy framework, uh, which is directing farmers' energies towards either um, a focus of food production or a wider set of metrics to do with mitigation of climate change, 
um, and to um, what, what are regarded as being public goods. So the DEFRA have been charged with, uh, with doing this in a very difficult time with COVID, uh, it, it taking away a lot of their staff resources um, and unexpected complications as a result of, of Brexit. Uh, and I would have to say that although they've been strongly criticised by the National Audit Office and, and by uh, various you know, parliamentarians, they have been working under very difficult circumstances and actually within a very uh, difficult um, set of uh, policy parameters from, from the government. And I think that most farmers who are involved with uh, beef and sheep uh, will be aware of the implications longer term of, of the free trade deals being conducted with Australia and New Zealand and the implications for further trade deals being conducted without regard to uh, the animal welfare standards, for instance, that we have in, in, the, in, in the UK at present. Um, so there is a certain, certain amount of uh, caveats in, in what I'm saying here uh, in relation to your farm businesses and farm profitability and decisions you might want to take uh, over the next few years. What I can point you towards is what opportunities there are uh, financially, um, in the pipeline and what are already being made, made available uh, through government announcements to help with sort of cash flow management uh, and also to consider offsetting the reduction in the basic payment scheme, uh, which is, has already started to have an impact on, on farm business profitability levels. So I'm also aware that with the audience uh, we have this evening, um, a lot of horticulturalists, new entrants, uh, and I think that it's only fair to, to talk a little bit around the opportunities that, that you would have uh, in this new uh, policy world, um, bearing in mind that part of the motivation for the changes in support levels for farming is actually to try and clear out what we call sort of dead wood of, of farming businesses that have been surviving on subsidy payments and to introduce a more entrepreneurial younger generation uh, into, into farming. Uh, through new entrance schemes and also through delinking uh, and decoupling uh, an exit scheme payments from from BPS for, for older generation of farmers. So there's a, a multiplicity uh, of work strands and initiatives sort of coming out of DEFRA. It would take me an awful lot longer than the time I've got available to actually go through all of these. Um, so I think we can have potentially questions you know, tailored to your individual circumstances uh, at the end. Uh, because I think that I, I will um, inevitably just trip over things you, you might want to know more about and perhaps spend too long on things you might find rather uh, arcane and not particularly interesting. Um, so just, just looking at the, um, the, sort of, the, the sort of five strands, I suppose, of, of support that are um, available at the present, Obviously, we are still involved with what they call legacy programs from the uh, CAP. So we still have BPS payments, they're being reduced. Uh, we still have countryside stewardship, we still have environmental stewardship. Um, some of the uh, productivity grants that were available for farm businesses have now been repackaged as farming investment fund, it was announced yesterday. Um, but essentially, um, the, these um, processes are still available uh, for farmers and certainly looking at countryside stewardship, the opportunity to lock into, if you're an organic farmer, in, into maintenance payments in particular, but also the, the capital grant items uh, and a certainly a certain um, number of very beneficial uh, options is just too strong to ignore. I, I would say that if you're not in a stewardship scheme at the moment, environmental stewardship scheme, that's where you, you need to be. Um, and there's a guarantee being given by DEFRA that you will not be disadvantaged by being in a environmental scheme like this. Uh, and if you want to switch into um, the new um, environmental land management schemes as and when they become available, uh, you'll be able to do so without penalty. So it's, it's a sort of one way bet. Um, and as an organic farm, certified organic farm, you will be entitled to, to enter into a new countryside stewardship agreement or extend your old one um, with the last payment, the last uh, entry dates being beginning of 2024. The, the caveat to that, which is something which has really frustrated us all the way through, is that there's a minimum holding area of five hectares. So if you have less than five hectares, you can't access 
uh, these schemes. And I think that's something which um, is a travesty and we've been lobbying very hard at Soil Association to get that changed. And there's every indication that, that will be changed um, when, when the new environmental land management schemes rolled out. So that aside, so what are the new uh, what are the new initiatives? So you'll be hearing a lot of acronyms, people talking about ELMS, for instance. The ELMS is the Environmental Land Management Scheme, and that's the umbrella for the government's ambition, basically, for, for farming uh, in the context of a, a wider set of uh, production imperatives to, to delivering public goods to justify getting subsidies. Um, it's been split into three parts, a sustainable farm incentive, uh, local nature recovery, and landscape recovery. And the envelope of BPS money has been secured for the term of this parliament, uh, not beyond that. Uh, and the split in payments is anticipated to be one third between each level of, the, of these um, components of the environmental land management scheme. The, the nature of the, 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 the um, elements of this are still unclear, which is very frustrating, but the sustainable farm incentive is at least taking shape and will be rolled out in 2022 in, in, a, in a, a basic form. Um, and that will comprise of a moorland standard. Um, it will comprise an agricultural soil standard and a grassland soil standard. We'll also include animal health and welfare pathway, which is at um, the moment fairly basically linked to securing uh, veterinary visits and veterinary advice and having a, a plan around uh, livestock management. That's going to kick, it, kick off in 2022. Pilots are already in place to make sure it's going to be, work effectively and run smoothly. Um, and then in 2024, a whole host of new standards are coming in. And for organic farmers in particular, this is the space to watch. We're lobbying very hard to secure um, a recognition of what organic farming delivers as a system. It's frustrating because the sustainable farming incentive is, is not conceptually thought through in that way, but we're working hard to ensure that you will get reward for what you're doing. And where, that, where you don't get that, we're hoping that will be picked up in the local nature recovery, uh, which at the moment is just a name and has no real substance, but is um, reputedly around paying people for doing the right thing in the right place, which we would argue that organic farmers do wherever they're operating. The landscape recovery component uh, has a minimum size of 500 hectares um, and is related to sort of long-term landscape change is not relevant to most farmers, unfortunately. It will have a significant impact on mitigating climate change and also changing the nature and appearance of a lot of uh, parts of the, of the country where it is taken up because it's largely going to be around tree planting. So the... Um, the final uh, section of this is the Future Farming Resilience Fund. And this is uh, an ongoing uh, process whereby you can access through government portals and organizations such as Soil Association advice to give you um, some guidance through this, um, this new world. It is complicated uh, and every farm is different. And I've spoken to quite a few farmers on this program uh, and it has been uh, very interesting to see how deep, different people are responding uh, to these changes and um, also frustrating that we can't give them all the answers that they, they need. So the final uh, area which I just wanted to talk touch upon briefly uh, is forestry, uh, farm woodland, forestry, trees, agroforestry even are going to become increasingly important uh, land use options for farmers and uh, so it's definitely worthwhile thinking through uh, whether, you, whether you feel there's an opportunity for you to, um, to look at woodland within your, within your holding. So if you just move to the next slide, please. So just in terms of the nuts and bolts of countryside stewardship, um, I imagine that um, you will be aware of, of this already, but if anyone who is new to the process, uh, we can obviously help you um, will help you through this or a land agent can help you um, but it is a uh, can be a complicated process uh, you need a big plan for your farm you need a long-term uh, sense of imperatives what you want what you want to do huge long list of options and the criticism of countryside stewardship has been that it has been a little bit too complicated a little bit too unwieldy um, 
and uptake has been fairly low uh, amongst farmers uh, for most of their duration. Uh, I think now that it has been slightly simplified, some more options have been put in uh, to make it more attractive because DEFRA certainly want farmers to take them up uh, if, if they feel they, they can qualify uh, because it will immediately start to um, combat climate change, mitigate um, some of the negatives around farming systems, which at the moment are um, very much in, in, in the crosshairs of, of government thinking. So um, this, we'll come to the next slide. So the, these are the payment rates that you would secure as an organic farmer. Um, and on top of those, there are options related to um, specific land use within your within your farming enterprise and access to capital grants. Um, it's a very long list. I really couldn't go through it all now. Um, and there's uh, exhaustive information on, on gov.uk. So I think, uh, as I say, rather than giving a, you know, a huge great amount of detail in this presentation, um, if you want to just have some questions you want to ask about your circumstances, I'm happy to answer those in the Q&A towards the end. Um, and I think that it, there are uh, initiatives around new entrants coming in um, to agriculture, which I haven't been able to go into yet because they're not fully formed uh, from the government. Uh, so I see that some of you are, are looking at coming into agriculture or horticulture particularly. Um, and uh, there, is, there is some information around that, which you can access um, through Soil Association or, or through Government UK. So I will now uh, hand over to you to my colleague, Mark, Palmer from uh, Soil Association Certification, uh, and he's going to host a, a five discussion and presentations with, with some organic farmers. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, yes, I don't envy you your job at all. <laughs> Having heard you speak in some meetings we go to, it's, uh, it's mind boggling the complexity of what is going on at the moment. Um, so uh, hello, everybody. I'm, uh, so I'm Mark Palmer. I, um, I've been with Soil Association Certification for just over six years now, and I'm an inspector covering every aspect of the organic production from field to fork. Um, and uh, so Beth um, had asked me to chair the meeting because I, um, the two William victims, James and Bob, have the dubious pleasure of knowing me. I've been on the receiving end of um, <laughs> wielding my, my non-compliance pen. And, not very much, I would add. Um, but uh, and, and what we want to talk about really is resilience and how um, the two farms have been, um, in particular, have been uh, uh, all planning ahead and and sort of have become or tried to remain resilient in the past. And one of my thoughts was, I thought, so what does resilience mean? So you can have a quick tap into Google and see what it says. And the sort of couple of definitions come out to me. Um, one is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness, um, or the ability of a substance or object to bring, spring back into shape, uh, uh, elasticity. Um, and other words that are coming up in there, such as flexibility, pliability, plasticity, elasticity, but also strength, toughness, hardness, adaptability, and buoyancy. So, both farmers being from the north, they probably match quite a good portion of those um, farming in some quite difficult areas in their own way. Um, so yeah, so it'll be really interesting to hear what they have to say. Um, so I'll keep quiet now and just introduce the two farms. They're both what we would call typical organic farms in as much as they're both totally different. Um, James uh, is a fifth generation farmer at Strictly. Um, they have probably one of the oldest Shorthorn dairy uh, herds in the country, a uh, pedigree herds in the country. Um, whereas Bob is a first generation farmer, a new entrant, uh, <laughs> a young new entrant, we should say. Um, and uh, he um, has a, an in, a career in industry um, uh, with other, and in other areas in, in the Northeast. Um, and has in the last sort of five or six years, probably sort of the, the market garden has taken off really. I think that's fair. Bob. So. Um, so, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce Bob, um, if you could introduce yourself, please, and sort of give us a bit about what your, your thoughts on resilience. Uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as 
Mark says, uh, myself and my wife, Anne, who you can see in the photograph there, now that was on a, a nice sunny day last year. Uh, we run Hexham Shower Organics, which is in Northumberland. We're 40 miles west of Newcastle. Uh, we're very much small scale compared to James. Uh, we've got 2.4 hectares. It's mainly vegetables and herbs. Uh, we grow vegetables on one acre of land, a uh, quarter of which is covered. Uh, we have 10 uh, large scale uh, polytunnels uh, because where we live, it's cold, wet and windy. Uh, we also have a two acre uh, fruit orchard. Uh, we've got a herd of pedigree Tamworth pigs, a uh, flock of chickens, and we employ uh, three people, one full time and two part time. As Mark says, I, uh, I worked in technology for 40 years. Uh, my wife ran a deli for 35 years and 11 days before my 60th birthday, uh, I had a change in uh, career and became a farmer. And uh, the last uh, five, six years have been absolutely amazing. And we've loved every single minute of it. And we've, um, we run, we have a box scheme where we average about 100 boxes a week. Uh, we're going to talk about, what, one of the things that uh, Sophie was talking about was about the organic market. And one of the key things I think is that uh, why, why people uh, want to go organic is one, it's the right thing to do. But secondly, um, you do get the advantage of a better price point uh, for your produce as well. Uh, we always intend to be organic from the start. And what we've seen, uh, again, following what, what Sophie says, uh, more and more customers want organic produce. Uh, our box scheme doubled uh, with the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic was actually very good for us. Um, we, we uh, also supplied two restaurants in the Northeast, uh, both in this year's Michelin Guide. We supply the only uh, Michelin star restaurant in Northumberland. You can see our polytons there. In, in between the polytons, that's uh, our herb garden. Um, that looks as if it's around about uh, June, July time. Um, we, as I say, we supply two uh, Michelin restaurants, one's a Michelin star, one's a Michelin plate. Uh, we used to uh, take our market stall uh, to market. Uh, that's, uh, that's the team. Uh, we were, some of those, um, there's, there's only uh, three of those. Uh, we're first, know, there's a couple of uh, temps in there as well. A very happy looking team, I think you would say. Uh, everybody's smiling for the camera. Um, so that's us, really. That's for, from an introduction. Uh, I don't know if uh, James wants okay. to introduce his, first of all. So, yeah, James, would you like to have a quick overview of what your farm is about? Yeah, hi. So, yeah, James Robinson from uh, Strictly, um, which is near Kendall. And we're in between Kendall and the motorway in um, South Cumbria. Uh, it's a family farm. So, like Mark said, uh, we are a fifth, well, I'm a fifth generation. Um, to farm uh, at Strictly of uh, Robinson's, been here since 1875. It was a tenanted farm to start with and it's grown and then we've bought um, neighbouring farms that have um, that have come off for sale. So we're now 300 acres all owned. Uh, it's all grassland. We're in a very good area for growing grass and not much else really. The topography of land is quite uh, challenging. So we've got some quite steep, uh, steep sided hills. Um, High rainfall, we're like sort of 50, 55 inches of rainfall. Um, but we have a herd of dairy short on cows, which are able to convert that grass reasonably um, efficiently uh, into organic milk. We've been organic for 16 years now, I think. And <laughs> I haven't actually written the date down ever, but I think uh, I, I've been telling people it's 16 years for the past two or three years, so I must be getting somewhere near, right? Um, we milk um, about 100, 120 dairy cows um, with followers behind them as well. So we've got about 260 head. The picture that's uh, in front of you now, that's our dairy herd walking back up about a month ago. Um, so we've got a very extended grazing season and they are walking. It's about a mile home up a track, up a cow track from there. So we've got a breed of cows that are able to uh, yeah, convert that grass, but then able to walk home. A long way as well for uh, milking. It takes about an hour from that place. Uh, there is me on farm, uh, there is dad, and there's my son Robert as well, who is um, on a farming apprenticeship scheme through Kendall College. 
Uh, Mum does the books and my wife, Michelle, is a part-time primary teacher and she does school visits, which we have through our uh, through a stewardship scheme, um, higher tier stewardship scheme. So we have we enjoy having school visits on farm and uh, sharing what we do with the local school children. Um, yeah, everything we do, we try and do for nature and the environment as well. So whenever we are planning any change, we look at how it's going to affect nature and, it and uh, the biodiversity or the habitat of that area and see what we can do to improve that and, um, and just, yeah, use nature as much as we can and try and help it along as well. Uh, I'm also the vice chair uh, of the uh, England Steering Group for the Nature Friendly Farming mm -hmm. Network. And it's a network that does fantastic things for nature and for fam. And I think that's about it. Okay, very good. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, the, uh, yeah, so sorry, there's a bit of a feedback there. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I think, um, as you can see, the both farms are, um, and I think one, one of the important things I was just, while, while James was talking there, I was just thinking actually, both of these, um, both of you are, are very passionate. Um, and I think that's what's always great. It's great to come and see you guys um, and hear your passion when we're going around the farm. And I know Bob's passion is growing and the veg and his no deep system. And I know um, James is a big dairy, or well, he's a reasonable sized dairy farmer. Um, you sort of, yeah, there's me cows, he says, but look at my river, look at my hedges. And his passion is definitely nature and what he's been doing on his farm. Get him talking about his uh, river, uh, um, taking out the canalisation of his river uh, later, hopefully. Um, so, in term, so I go to you first, Bob, and say, uh, where do you see resilience in the um, in your business? Uh, you know, if you're trying to sell your business to me, or trying to say, what well, I should be doing this, what where do you see your resilience, and how does it, um, how does being organic help with that? I mean, resilience covers a number of things. And um, one of the things that uh, is very important to us is our customer base. Um, we try to make sure that our customers are part of our journey, whether or not that is a box scheme customer or whether or not that's a restaurant. Uh, you saw a photograph earlier on of our, of, of our delivery van, which is an electric van. Uh, the deliveries are all made by either myself or my wife, Anne. Um, to either the boxing customer or to uh, the restaurants. And my wife, Anne, runs, uh, writes a, a weekly blog, which is on our website. Uh, so if anybody wants to look at that, that's on www.hexamshoworganics.co.uk. And she's written that blog for uh, three, four years now. And it, it tells people about the story, our journey, what we're doing that week. And we want our customers to be part of that journey. Uh, likewise, with uh, the restaurants, uh, all, all deliveries to restaurants are made by Anthony myself or my wife Anne. Uh, we have a fantastic relationship with uh, our restaurants. Uh, we have uh, visits to, to our chefs, by, by the chefs to, to the place to see what we've grown. Uh, we were particularly nervous when uh, we were first approached by a restaurant because we weren't really sure whether or not we'd be able to uh, provide enough uh, vegetables for, for the restaurant, the Michelin Star restaurant. And I said, what happens if one week we don't have what we gave you last week? And the, and the, uh, the chef patron basically says, we'll change our menu depending on what you've got. And that's the sort of relationship we have. So resilience for me very much starts with uh, the customer. The next thing I would look at is to make sure that we're selling the right produce, the produce that people want to buy. And I think from an organic point of view, uh, there's more and more people are interested in organic produce. There's more and more people interested in having local organic produce. Uh, people want to shorten their, uh, their food miles. And there's a market out there for people. Uh, the price point is right uh, for us to make a good living out of it. I mean, as Sophie said, uh, home delivery grew by 36% in 2020, which is a staggering uh, rise. And we saw our box skin double in size uh, with the start of the pandemic and the, the momentum has, has, has stayed there. So if you give people what they want, and we very much see that people do want organic produce, uh, you, you aren't no winner. Um, so to me, resilience is about getting the best project, produce you possibly can 
and make sure you look after your customer base and that organic strand runs through both of those. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, that sounds fine. So, James, what, what are your sort of initial thoughts on, on the resilience of your business, which I'm, you know, I'm guessing is a, is a long-standing owned farm, so you've got relatively good security of tenure, um, you've got a very established business, and you've got, you've got generations around you. So where does your resilience sort of start and end, do you think? Yeah, um, yeah. so like I said, we've been, uh, our family's been at Strictly um, for, yeah, getting towards 150 years now. Um, yeah, we've got reasonable security of tenure. All the banks still have a fair chunk of, a fair chunk of that. Uh, like I say, we've been buying. We've sort of bought the last neighbouring farm, or we bought the latest neighbouring farm to us um, uh, three years ago. So yeah, so there's still a big uh, minus against the bank on that. But um, we did that really to build a more secure future for the next generation coming on. Really to make it more. Uh, to make it a size that was uh, that could compete. Really, you know. So we 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 need. We need that extra ground really to so we weren't relying on um, um landlords with tenanted ground uh with short and there's a lot of short um short lets um you know so we, uh, some are lets three six four day grazing licenses are things which for us for uh for a more secure future it wasn't a lot of good to us really so we were we looked at um we're lucky enough to buy the neighboring farm um so that's put us in good stead really for the future everything sort of starts really at the ground level. I mean, you can see on that picture in front of you, that's um, one of our sort of furthest fields and the clover that's in there. Um, we're looking at um, providing everything we can from the soil up. We're looking at maybe uh, at, at growing more of our own crops as well. Uh, and in fact, we we've, um, we've, haven't fed any soya or palm oil for two years now. We took that out of the diet. We were very concerned with uh, very concerned with the image that the dairy industry has or the livestock industry has in this, in this country uh, with imported soya and the organic side wasn't any different to that uh, as far as we could tell. Whether the soya was grown in South America or um, Southern Europe or North America, wherever it was, it, it, it was displacing something else. So um, we're now sort of using more UK based proteins and beans and, and lucerne. Um, so yeah, so soya was one of the first things that, that we did take out after the sort of after a lot of the documentaries that were on TV that were showing feedlots and things in America, and there was a lot of confusion in this country with how livestock was raised in this country. So we did take out the soya straight away after that. Um, it was a lot harder to do than we thought, and a lot harder to do than we than it should be really, because there is such a reliance on imported proteins in this country, not just for, mm -hmm. for conventional diets, but for Life, for, but for organic livestock as well so um but yeah and everything starts with a cow really as well for us we've got a, we've got a breed of cows that's able to uh look after itself uh, walk a long way great health traits great fertility and be able to produce milk off that green stuff as well okay yeah so that's um, that's great to hear um it's interesting you were saying about you know you you've taken soya and palm oil out of the out of the cow diet um you know is that an economic decision as well um no it's actually cost us slightly more per ton it's probably about five pound a ton more mm -hmm. um and the, the nutritionist will tell you that the proteins aren't as good if they're not soya as well this bypass protein that soya is um it's an exceptional feed really for getting into a dairy cow but um we uh, as a dairy industry, uh, especially high, high yielding cows, you know, these herds that are doing 10, 12,000 litre averages, they've the bred a cow, or we as an industry have bred a cow really that is struggling to be fed on anything that can be grown in this country. And it's mm. to be, 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 be fed on grass, you know, they have to have huge amounts of maize going into the diet as well, like high starch maize, high energy. And um, yeah, grass just doesn't cut the mustard anymore, unfortunately, with these <laughs> high yield yeah, yeah. yields. And, and that, I well, I'm sure we've gone down the wrong path if uh, if we can't mm -hmm. feed the cow that's being bred. And that's happening faster and faster uh, all the time with, with genomics as well. You know, the, the genetic uh, speed is, is, is increased radically in the last sort of 10 years with, with genomics. So, um, yeah. Um, there's going to be a point really that um, we can, you know, that we, we won't be able to feed that cow with feed that, that are available. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I agree with you there. I think it's. Um, uh, did you uh, did you notice any um, negative effects of, of the change of protein? Uh, no, no, no. You, you see, yeah. cows are fat. I think our breed helps them yeah. quite stoic and quite you know quite um, quite resilient to any any change. Yeah. Okay. That's that, that's great. That's, that's what I was hoping you'd say. Um, uh, so. Um, if we go, go to Bob and um, sort of ask him, where does uh, what what are your biggest problems, Bob? You know, you, you say you've got a you know you've got a good resilient business that's, that's close to the customer, um, you know, and you you listen to what the customer says, and the customer's actually happy to work with you. But where do you see your big big problems? Um, your costs. Well, every day is a learning day. Um, you know, there, there, there's there will be something happens every day which will 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 just make you scratch your head and you've got to think of solutions to things. Uh, the biggest problem we have, when we first started, uh, you know, it, it's great listening to James and, you know, his fifth generation, uh, uh, that's brilliant. Uh, myself and my wife, Anne, uh, had, had a, an, an allotment. And we used to think we knew how to grow veg uh, until we became, uh, our, our livelihood depended on growing uh, veg successfully. And we realised how little we knew and so, you know, it's the, the, the biggest problem we had initially was weed management. Uh, and then we went no dig and no dig was a massive uh, help as far as that's concerned. But whenever we uh, initially had problems with pests or disease, or all, you've got to think what the solution is. Uh, and there's a great network of help out there, either uh, through the uh, people in the, in the Soil Association or local farmers. There's a great... Fa Farmers help each other, and you know there's always somebody you can go and, and ask for advice or guidance, and you know what that's one of the things that uh, we've all got to remember as well. If somebody comes to ask us for advice or guidance, you know we've got to give them time as well. So I think we help each other. Um, so you know, as I say, every day is a learning day. What we try to do is, um, I used to be a management consultant, and apologies for the next bit I'm going to say, which is management consultant speak. Uh, but we work on the basis of we plan tomorrow, today, we plan next week, this week, we plan next year, this year. So we're always looking ahead. We're always looking to see uh, what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to grow, uh, what we're going to change, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Uh, we make a note of everything that uh, goes wrong and what we can do to prevent it uh, going wrong again. So, you know, it's all about learning from experience uh, and improving, uh, you know, uh, whether or not it's soil fertility, whether or not it's pest management, whether or not it's weed management. Um, when you asked uh, about uh, problems we, we've had, when we first started, it was myself and my wife, and then we suddenly realised, well, didn't suddenly realise, we realised we better get some help in because, um, you know, we, we were struggling to cope, and then, a biggest challenge is taking on staff uh, because when do you do that? How many do you take on? How do you get the right people? And we're extremely fortunate in that the team we've got working for us at the moment are fantastic. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're keen, they're enthusiastic, they're interested in what we do. Uh, it's very much a team uh, approach where uh, everybody offers advice and, and, and insights into things. So it's, um, you know, it, to say there's different problems. The, the biggest decision we've made in just in the last couple of weeks is uh, we've decided actually we're not going to get any bigger. Uh, when <clears throat> when you first start, you think, well, you know, how many, you know, we'll, we'll keep on selling boxes and we'll maybe just get an uh, employer driver and we'll, we'll maybe just, uh, take on more stuff. What we've decided to do from our business model point of view is to get better rather than bigger. Uh, we're going to specialise in certain things. We're going to make sure we grow things that nobody else can grow in the region and make sure that we're, we're specialist uh, and we're good at being a specialist grower. So as I say, there's, there's different things. Each farmer will have to decide where they're going to go. But, uh, you know, we, we, look, we look at uh, our business day in, day out. What can we do to get better? OK, yeah, that sounds... Um... So, James, in terms of um, resilience, you sort of, you know, you, you've talked about the cows and how they they are the basis, and the farm and the soils and the, and the, the grass is the basis of your of your business. Um, the, there are must must be areas though that you um, you aren't in control of. How how do you manage those, and what's your sort of you know because the you know the the area that you can't control is also impacts on the resilience of a business. You know. We're, 
you talk to a, a non-organic farmer and they talk about the cost of fertilizer you know well at the moment you must you know slight degree of smugness amongst <laughs> organic, yeah. organic yeah. farmers yeah. because of that but you know there are numerous other problems so what what are your sort of headaches what causes you uh yeah i suppose the last few years we've had a very um had some unusual early summers you know late spring early summer so it's been very cold very dry um and then followed you know and then we've had a little patch of rain and then followed on by a very dry summer so last um two years ago we put in some herbal lays on about 15 acres and they have done remarkably well this last <laughs> year they were the the one thing you know when we had that real long dry droughty spell they were the one field that the cows could keep going back on they probably grew 50 percent uh, more than the rest of the mm -hmm. equivalent layers, putting more of that in, and it's just really just to give us more um, more drought resilience. Really, you know, more uh, the, that 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 ability to keep growing something, you know, and it's and it's yeah. uh, and it's the and it's the chicory and it's a plantain and it's a deeper rooted clover. Those mm -hmm. are the things that that, that do grow. Uh, it's the rye grasses that really struggle. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, even even white clover can do remarkably well, um, you know, given the given the right um, the right care. So yeah, we've gone down that route. Not everything is going to go down to a herbal layer, um, but uh, we've got loads of permanent pastures that we that we won't be ploughing. Uh, they're more diverse, just in their in their uh, natural makeup. But yeah, these fields that we are that, that, that now in this reseeding rotation are definitely going to go down to more herbal mm -hmm. layers. I must admit, when, when we looked at your new field you bought a couple of years ago, um, and you said to me there was something like, if I remember rightly, 120 different species of plants in those fields, uh, which is an astounding number of species. And um, yeah, so that it's um, yeah, the the, the the hay meadows that are in those down there, they are they are quite exceptional. I think yeah, just maybe not quite 120, but somewhere getting towards 110, I think species. Well, maybe by now, if we did another uh, species count, then there maybe would be 120. But um, yeah, and they are managed specifically for that diversity there, and the hay that comes off those fields are quite incredible. You know, mm -hmm. they are, it, um, it looks as good as it smells and it probably tastes as good as it looks as well. Um, and it's just fantastic to open one of those bales up in, in a horrible, wet, blowy winter's day, knowing what it was like when it was standing and when it was med hair in uh, yeah. July. Great, okay. Um, uh, so wh where do you think, and obviously you were talking about, you know, the, the work you've been doing on the farm for, for nature. Um, or working with nature. I think it's fair to say we work with nature, don't we? We don't, you know. Um, where, how does that bring you resilience? Uh, it could probably start with hedges. I think hedges are my um, sort of nerdy moment, really. We've got like seven miles of hedges, 10 k's of hedges at Strictly, and we've managed them on a traditional hedge lane rotation for, well, probably forever. Um, and this uh, this hedge lane rotation is like a twenty year rotation. So um, once we've just actually started hedge lane for the for the winter um, today. Um, so the next time we'll be doing that, um, I'll be well into my sixties. Um, my dad, who was here hedging today with us, or dad, was <laughs> Robert, um, they won't be they won't be. Well, sorry, dad won't be hedging that again. You know, so we're probably only doing these these hedges uh, two or three times within a lifetime. Um, hedges that are absolutely fantastic. Um, they're not only are they a boundary between fields and the mark in that boundary, they're uh, for shelter for the for the crop and for the animal. Even grass benefits from the shelter of a hedge. Doesn't have to be a, an expensive crop. And then, um, then there's the, the wildlife and habitat benefit of them and it's just, it's astounding to really to, to sort of just sit and watch and see what what's actually living within that hedge. And if I manage them on a on this twenty year rotation, we get everything from a newly laid, sort of three foot high, three foot wide hedge, to something that uh, if it's twenty year old, it's going to be twenty five foot high and could be it could be twenty foot wide. You know, and all that all the grassland that's underneath that, all the dead and all the dead wood and everything that, that lives within that, and uh, and all the mulch and bats use them as hunting highways and bird life and yeah so hedges are the one thing that is, that ties our farm together mm -hmm. and they're tying this all these other habitats the rivers the ponds 
um, the wetland areas, the woodland, it's all it's all tied together with these, with these hedgerow, high, hedgerow highways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I must admit they do. And it's um, somebody, somebody said to me recently, well, hedges should be like a cathedral inside. You know, it's like a big arch. You can get inside and, you know, a good hedge. Um, yeah, that. And, I think and, and, if, and if we've got this full, if we're doing it on a traditional rotation, uh, rather than trying to do loads in one year and then nothing mm. for, for 10 years mm. or something, or you're flailing every year, if you've got this, this nice rotation, you've got, you've got all the different sizes, different species of butterflies, beetles, birds, they all live within different sizes of hedges, so uh, we need that full uh, mosaic of, um, of uh, management across it all. Yep, and... and um... So, and you haven't mentioned you're your, your rewilding your river yet, which I know last time I came, we spent about 10 minutes looking at the farm, and three hours looking at your, your rewilded yeah. river, rewilding yeah, so plans for your river. So. That's it, yeah. So that was done in June. We we, uh, we started on that and it was quickly happened. We'd done quite a lot within a month. And um, yeah, so I previously canalised portions of Beck, um, which this is a, a small river. Um, we've re-wiggled it to the technical term and created some scrapes and some ponds within that as well. Um, we've done that really for habitat. Um, we've done it also for flood resilience, sorry, flood mitigation, I should say, uh, for further downstream. Um, it's also, I think it's improved the land around it. So whereas the the, the old can, canalised area, the water wasn't able to drain into that, um, the, the other sort of surface water and things. Now it can get into these channels, it can get into these ponds and scrapes, and the amount of stuff that can live in, in and around that as well. I mean, I just had a quick walk down today and it's full of, full of wintering birds, full of wintering snipe, and some thrushes and things on there as well, and loads of little tiny fish in the water already, and it's only been done three or four months. Mm -hmm. Real, I look, look forward to seeing it again soon. Um, so, uh, Bob, when you um, come back to you, um, one of the resilient things that I think I see on farms, you go to their, um, you know, you go and do an application inspection and then you go back a couple of years later and you go back a couple of years later then. Um, and, and it's almost like diff talking to a different farmer in terms of how their mind changed. And so uh, one of the things I think is, does give resilience is, um, or I'm interested in, is mindset change. But how do you do you think your mind changed or has your mindset changed when you you, you probably don't have the bad habits of a, a non-organic farmer. So you didn't have the mindset to change, maybe like James. And I'm going to ask James the same question in a minute. So, um, so Bob, what do you how do you um, feel about that? I think we're changing all the time, uh, Mark. We're, we're, we're constantly looking to see uh, what we can do differently. We're, we're certainly not setting our ways uh, in things. I mean, uh, just backing onto the previous discussion, discussion with uh, James about uh, uh, about uh, wildlife and things like that. One other thing that uh, we've noticed is when we first started um, with with our grown, uh, at that, that when we first started, we used to dig our soil uh, and we had so few worms. And if you saw a worm, you would go worm because it was so infrequent. So our soil health now is so much better than what it was uh, we've just got an abundance of, of worms uh, growing there and things like that. The, 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 the life below the soil is, is really, really important as well. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing to make sure that our soil health is, is improved. Um, as I say, we're, we're constantly looking to change. Uh, we're constantly looking to see what we should do. Uh, there'll not be a day goes by we, we don't make a decision to... Uh, you know, to, to, today we're having a discussion about what we're going to grow under cover next year, which is different to what we grew um, under cover this year. And, you know, and where we're going to plant things and uh, our, our planting uh, dates and everything. So we're constantly looking to see, uh, our view is, what can we do better? What can we do to improve? And we're looking to be the best we possibly can. So we're definitely not stuck in our ways. We're always looking uh, to improve. We're always looking for... Uh, to see what people have to say. We're looking to see if uh, what the latest thoughts are from uh, across the world on this. We pick up an awful lot from up from North America and what they do. Um, so yeah, the world's constantly changes as far as we're concerned. Mm. Okay, yeah, great. thank you. So, so James, 
you had a, a misspent youth like I did working on um, running a, a, a non-organic farm. So um, uh, what, how, how's your mindset changed when you converted, if you can remember back all those years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we looked at converting a few years before we actually did and we, um, we were quite negative about it. So probably three or four years before we actually converted, we, we looked at it and we're quite negative about it. And we said, well, we won't be able to do this. We won't be able to do that. How are we going to do that? And, and we kind of shut the door on it. And then because it was going to be too much, too, you know, too many unsurmountable problems, we thought. Mm. Then we looked at it again a few years after that. And we started thinking, well, other people manage it for starters. <laughs> we can do, you know, and, and we started looking at solutions for the for the problems rather than, you know, looking for the problems as it were. And um, yeah, but there, there was three things I always thought we would struggle with. One was cow health, uh, as particular mesisis. One was growing enough forage for them, and the other one was um, docks. Uh, cow health is far far better now than it ever was. Uh, mesisis rates of and and somatic cell counts have come down every year since and now we're on a, a PWAB system as well with our milk biome score so we're actually on a producer that antibiotic system now and we've only got one cow in the herd that's had antibiotics in the last 12 months currently which is mm -hmm. uh, that'll be gone before too long um so that's really look you know so we've managed to we we by doing uh, the um, by being organic for the last 15, 16 years, we've uh, bred a really healthy herd. So the cows are really looking after themselves now. Grass, we can grow probably, I think, 90% of the grass that we could um, with, uh, you know, that we were growing before when we're using artificial fertilizers. But given we were putting 40, 45 tonne of artificial fertilizers on, um, <laughs> you know, that's a lot of input for only 10% more grass. Um, so that's that's fine. We can do that. And then docks, I always thought were going to be a big problem. And then we have still got docks, but then we uh, have got a fantastic little green chap called a green dock beetle who keeps the docks just about in check. So and the fact that we've got this sort of the way we're managing the fields and the cutting and the and the grazing and um, not using any sprays anywhere, of course. We've got dock beetles everywhere and they do a real good job of just controlling those docks. So it was just our mindset really had to change at the start. And we've got to stop looking over our neighbor's head who puts, you know, a uh, couple of hundred kilo of, of artificial nitrogen on every year um, because we're not farming like they are. We are farming how we want to farm on our particular farm. And we have to really, um, you know, just look at what works well on our farm and stick with that, I think. And then also, of course, learn from others as well. You know, we're not we're not stuck in our ways enough that um, that, that that we think we're doing everything perfectly because there's uh, everything can be improved. Great. Yep. Okay. That that's um, that's fine. Um, and sort of tying back into what Adrian was saying, and I and I suspect James might have more of a view on this than Bob because um, at the moment. Um, if we go to Bob first, the, the obviously you're not quite so challenged by the changes to the BPS and the uh, subsidy system. I, I, I'm suspecting Bob being under five hectares. Yeah, yeah get nothing from anybody. Yep, yep. So, do, um, and you're you, uh, uh, obviously you're I'm interested in what Adrian. I'm interested. In Adrian says I'm going to try and uh, lower the uh, the five hectares. That would that would be interesting to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so James, what's your sort of view on how how do you see that threat in the future? I'm guessing your farm payment must be sort of in the you know is a, is a reasonable amount given you've got 300 acres. So, um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So we uh, where we actually look today. So uh, I mean, I'm not uh, you know I'm quite open with it. We've got uh, 25,000 pound from our BPS last year. Um, it'll be less this year because it's coming back this year a little bit, isn't it? I think was it next year? Um, this year, I think, isn't it? It's coming down a bit. Adrian's probably nodding. Um, yeah, um, so that's a big chunk. You know, it's a man's, you know, pretty much a man's wage, really, I suppose, isn't it? Uh, or a person's wage. Um, but we, we, so we've been on stewardship schemes, environmental schemes for 30 years now, uh, since 1991. And 
every scheme that comes up, we try we make it work for the farm. So we, we pick the options that work well with what we're doing and then pick the options that um, help us with our sort of habitat creation and wildlife as well. And everything, and then the farm and the and the environmental schemes will all work together. You know, we don't see mm -hmm. the environmental scheme as a separate income. It's mm -hmm. very much part of the farm. And the uh, elms, the SFI, um, the um, local recovery, we, it, it's going to be something that we will really try and make work for us as well. You know, we we, we will be looking at the options that that work well with the way that we're farming now, and if we have to change. Some of the way that we found it in a positive way to, to fit with the options, then we will. But it has to work as a business. You know, the um, all, all the environmental payments, they are very, very much part of the farm. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, you know, and there's still a long way to go, I think, in terms of, I know, Adrian's sort of, you know, um, talks I've, I've experienced as well. I know Adrian does, you know, have we got, do you know, Adrian, when we're looking at a, um a, a sort of an idea what's going to happen price wise input wise uh, sort of cost wise in terms of sfi um and local nature recovery network are they going to put some pounds on the on the things at some point in the near future or we've got to wait another couple of years yeah yeah there, 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 are, there are some some figures and i think that the there's going to be an announcement uh, at the end of this month uh which will put sort of a final uh, a figure on the, the payments for the soil standards, uh, mm -hmm. which will be in place for, for next year for the agriculture and grass and soil. Um, and there will be some figures around the, the animal health and welfare pathway also. Um, I mean, I'm interested because the, uh, the evolution of, of, of local nature recovery is taking rather longer to take shape. But one of the areas they, they are focusing on is uh, collaboration amongst farmers. And I'm just wondering, uh, in relation to the work you're doing with, with the BEC, uh, whether there are other farmers upstream, downstream, who, who you perhaps work with, and is there a, a catchment sensitive uh, scheme that you are engaged with, are you, are you in NVZ and some of these other um, areas? Um, yeah, so we're not in an NVZ. Um, there is some catchment sensitive funding that we can get for uh, things like roofing yards and tracks and that type of thing um unfortunately we're a little bit of an island really when it comes to um environmental projects um and yet our um you know the the the, the habitat or the the possible habitats uh, of all our neighboring farms are exactly the same as us they've all got bits of becks and woods and hedges and things and it's just the way that it's managed um and i think we're quite often seen as a little bit of um or what strictly doing now type of type of thing people looking over the hedge but I know, I know for a fact that we are, we must be making a change because, like, uh, a neighbour who has never ever done anything for mm -hmm. wildlife environment before has planted up um, some wet areas with some with some trees through the Woodland Trust this time, and uh, first environmental work that they've ever done, and they've done that. I kind of know because of what what we've done. So it's 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 kind of, well not leading by example because that's the wrong that's the wrong thing that kind of makes you feel. It makes you sound better than you are, but it's just doing the right thing and hoping that people take notice of the of the positive change that that does. And then um, you know, and if and if people see that we've done a, a decent job and we've created a bit of habitat and we've got some wildlife back, and then that's um, you know, and we've ended up with cleaner water or whatever it might be, then you know, then that's uh, that kind of spurs you on to do a bit more. Okay, great, thank you, um, Beth. I'm thinking we should maybe move on to questions now would that be sort of open it up and for have a bit more of a general discussion if people have got burning questions they'd like to ask bob adrian or um james yeah we've and had Sophie. a sorry and Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah we have had um yeah a few quite a few questions so um i think i'll start with the the panel discussion questions actually first for james and bob um these are quite sort of specific questions um yeah thanks thanks everyone for put, popping these in the chat um James, have you done a carbon audit? And if you have, how does that compare to a similar non-organic dairy farm? Hedges are undervalued, and that's from Dusty. Uh, hi, yeah, we, uh, I have. Uh, it was it was on an agricultural corn. I did it, and to be honest, I can't remember what the figure was. Um, I found it. Um, 
a little bit disheartening to do because there were so many, so many, um, you know, like the, the 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 hedges or the or the wetland areas that we've got, or any of the mosses or the permanent grass. That very little of that is actually counted as a as a calculation, and it's really pretty much on on inputs and outputs, um, stuff that you buy in and stuff that you sell. Um, as far as I'm aware, OMSCO have done a lot more on it in terms of a uh, so that's our milk supplier cooperative, and uh, they've. Um, They've done a lot of work on it uh, as a more group, and the uh, organic milk is coming out of a much lower carbon footprint than conventional, um, with the with the sort of initial figures, anyways. Which which is which is great to see. It's kind of what we know, and uh, but uh, yeah, you would kind of need to add in those those the the, the 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 sequestration of the carbon as well as the input and output. Um, and yes, I would agree, hedges are very much an undervalued thing, and I really hope that the new SFI. Um, he's going to offer some decent payments to um, to encourage farmers to manage their hedges in a far better way. Brilliant, thank you, James. Um, and just an another question, actually, for you, James. Um, uh, and I hadn't ever I hadn't heard of dock beetles before, actually. So that's a new piece of learning for me. Um, did you always have dock beetles, or is that something that's like more recent? Uh, we probably always we always had them, I think, because, but the life cycle quite often probably got disrupted by sprays and things. Um, so the fact we have we're not using any herbicides now, of course, means that uh, they get chance to go to that full life cycle around, which I think is about six weeks from uh, from grub to sorry from eggs to grub to beetle. Um, and the what they do on a field of docks is quite incredible if they are allowed to. Um, sometimes it doesn't work with with cutting dates and things in your silage meadows, but um, quite often it is uh, it is quite phenomenal how they will just go across an entire field and you get into August September, loads and loads of clover out in your in your fields and you've just got little black lacy bits of the dock left and they just wither away and die to nothing. So, uh, but of course they never actually kill the dock completely. Otherwise, dock beetle wouldn't have anywhere to live. So um, they just keep a lid on them a little bit. Yeah. And, and does a chair with this bob? Does a dock beetle does it eat other things other than, than dock? I think the only thing they the other thing they eat is a plantain, I think, if I'm right. Um, but not we we haven't noticed them attacking the plantains that we've got in our herbal layers, so it must be a specific type of plantain. But um, yeah, pretty much solely the dock, I think. So they'd be quite safe with your cabbages and stuff, I would think. Thanks, Sam. I've never heard about it before, actually. So I've, I've, I've dug out about three thousand docks. So. I'm sure they have a, a scientific name, more technical than a green dock beetle, but um, yeah, they're a pretty cool little chap. You, you could trap them and sell them, I think, if you could find a decent... Uh... <laughs> maybe I should, maybe I should. <laughs> probably a better income than selling milk, I would think. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks guys. Um, and another question from Michelle. This is uh, aimed at, I guess, Bob and James. Um, so Bob, maybe you can comment on this first. Um, have you had any problems with chemical spray drift from your neighboring farms, the non-organic ones? Uh, we did this year, actually. Um, we had um, the, the farmer next to us uh, is non-organic, and I don't know what it was he was spraying, but it was around about sort of May, June time. And he sprayed in the field next to our polytunnels. And basically, we were looking that it didn't damage more, uh, many things because of uh, were protect, protected by the polytunnels. But because it was a warm day, well, most days we had the uh, doors open and we had some drifting, and it really affected our broad bean uh, flowers. Um, but, you know, uh, wife Anne went, went across to see them and basically said, um, explained what had happened and how, how it impacted and he was very very good and he basically said look I'm really sorry the next time I'm doing something I'll let you know to give you a chance to, to close your polytons or, or whatever so you know um, you will if, you, if, you, if you're bordering something which is non-organic you do run that risk uh, but in six years that's the only time it's ever happened um, and uh, we learned a lot from that uh, you know had a good conversation with a guy and he was fine. Goodness knows what he was spraying. Brilliant, thank you, Bob. And yeah, just just from an auditing point of view, Mike, you may be able to comment on this as well. Um, you know, ch checking uh, farms do have you know an established uh, hedgerow between uh, boundaries or you know a buffer strip to avoid obviously that happening, like you said, Bob. Um, 
Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you, Bob. Um, in, in, um, I mean, we're interested in, you know, between our two fields, uh, we had um, our, our hedge wall has got to be 10 foot, 12 foot high and as thick as anything. And it's still, you know, if, if, if it's a windy day or there's a breeze or whatever, you've got, you've got to be really careful. Brilliant. Thank you, Bob. Um, so Abby's actually asked a question. Um, how do you engage with other farmers and growers next door and in wider networks to share learning? So James, I don't know if you've got any comments on that. Um, yeah, so neighbours, like I say, that's pretty much just looking over the hedge and hoping that because so, farmers are, you know, the, the, the coy things really like you'll just look over a hedge and you'll and you'll you won't say that you're impressed like but you'll you know you, you might you might quietly be impressed at someone's cows or crop or whatever it might be so yeah neighboring farmers is very much a, just as like a see and hopefully learn uh, but we um I've, I've engaged quite a lot on social media if i can with the way that we farm um never ever forcing anything down people's necks of anything or saying about educating this or you must do this. Uh, I very much just show people what we do as a farm and uh, everyday things from milking to hedging to, to making sandwiches, whatever it might be. And it's just hoping that they will then see the way that we farm, uh, which may influence the way that they buy. Uh, they they shop um, and then also a local well other farmers from all around the country all around the world can sort of hopefully see the way that we do things like hedge hedgerow management is a particular one that I know people do spend a lot of time commenting on and things and then I'm like I say I'm also on the nature friendly farming network as well so we'll try and engage as much as we can with that with the, with the right type of farming. Brilliant, thank you, James. Um, let me just see if we've got. Yeah, on, on that one, I mean. Yeah. We, we reach out to farmers all the time. It's um, um, so it's uh, it, it's amazing. You know, it, it's about building up a network. It's about uh, asking and sharing advice. And uh, one of the things I've found is that farmers are, you know, a great group of people who are willing to share, who are willing to have a chat, uh, and willing to pass on advice and guidance. And uh, you know, if we all continue that, we'll have uh, uh, we'll all have, we'll all be better farmers. Brilliant. Thanks, Bob. And I, I thought it was interesting, actually, what both of you were saying about your sort of like change in mindset and, you know, that running a farm is just constant learning curve and, you know, you're always trying to sort of better what you what you have been doing the previous year. Um, so that's definitely like really facilitated by working with other farmers and learning from them. Um, yeah, so just, we were just on that, Beth, um, yeah. uh, the farmer I was talking to last week, I, I said something to him about, you know, we've had a really good year this year, but next year we're going to be uh, we're going to be even better. And uh, this, this farmer turned around me and started laughing. He went, you do know, Bob, that's why farmers never retire, because <laughs> next year is always going to be better. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, right. Just um, aware that I just want to address Kylie's question. Um, Kylie, I think you asked about the consumer research, which Sophie has actually added some more information about um, when she covered in her slides and she's popped some stuff in the chat there. Um, but you're interested to know if consumers are being asked about local food as part of that research um, and whether this is important to them. Um, Sophie, are you able to comment on whether that was asked as a specific yeah, question? Yeah, I don't think there was a huge focus on local food. It was, it was very much an organic kind of focused piece of research. However, it did look at other kind of sustainability trends as part of that, but I don't think there was necessarily a deep dive on, on local food there. Um, probably the, the next kind of, um, again, not necessarily a deep dive, but it will definitely look into kind of shorter supply chains and box schemes and things. As it, it'll probably be our next organic market report, which as I said earlier, is gonna be released in uh, February. Um, and that will have a whole section on kind of box schemes, home delivery, short supply chains, which, as we said, is kind of a clear opportunity. So, um, yeah, and obviously local kind of feeds into that. But there are obviously lots of kind of box schemes and home delivery models as well, which might have a, an element of local, an element of um, maybe, you know, buying from, from other areas as well. So um, that's probably the, the best kind of insight we can do there. And there was also another question around um, the... The people who were surveyed and it, it was a kind of um, a cross-section um, of shoppers uh, it was a thousand respondents all together um, and yeah completely kind of a, a randomized survey it was we used a um, 
a research con uh, and marketing consultancy company called As the Crow Flies. So um, all done very much kind of in line with kind of research protocols and so on. Um, but I popped the leaflet into the chat. So if anyone wants to find out a bit more, there's some more info there um, about that research specifically as well. And um, just just to note, Kylie, um, as you are one of our licensees, that the organic market report, obviously, that is, in, you know, that's included within your certification. So, yeah, you'll get next year's and that should hopefully provide you with a bit more insight. Um, I think we're kind of coming to time a little bit. Um, I hope I've covered everyone's questions in the chat, but please feel free to unmute yourself and shout at me if I haven't. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think it's been a really interesting session um and it's really great to hear from from both you bob um and james um obviously quite different farms and it's really great to hear sort of really honest feedback from you about the opportunities and challenges that you faced over the last, last couple of years in running an organic farm um yeah i think uh I think yeah i think that's really what we've all we've got time for but um is there any last comments from anyone um yeah uh, feel free to unmute yourself and and say <laughs> Nope. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, everyone have a lovely evening. Thanks for joining us. And um, thank you to all our speakers. And um, thanks to the Northern Rural Farming Conference for organising um, what hopes to be a brilliant week of um, talks. So yeah. <laughs> all right. Have a lovely evening. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everyone.